Welcome and thank you for joining us at the conversation presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Ed Schwartzchild and I'm a fellow at the Writers Institute and Director of Creative Writing here at UAlbany. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, Danielle Evans, uh, let me remind you that this and all our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel. You can find them at the conversation on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you wish to support future programming like this, you can make a donation at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org, and we would, of course, be grateful. Our guest today is Danielle Evans. She is the author of the story collection, uh, The Office of Historical Corrections, recently published, and before that, uh, the collection Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self. Her work has won awards and honors, including the Penn American Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Hurston Wright Award for Fiction, and the Patterson Prize for Fiction. She's a 2011 National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree and a 2020 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow. Her stories have appeared in magazines all over at the Paris Review, A Public Space, American Short Fiction, uh, Callaloo, the Sewanee Review, and others. Uh, they've been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories 2008, 2010, 2017, and 2018. And she's also had work in New Stories from the South. Uh, Danielle received her MFA in fiction from the Iowa Writers Workshop. She's taught creative writing at American University in Washington, DC, and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she currently teaches in the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins University. Danielle, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to get to talk with you. It's been a pleasure to be uh, reading your work and teaching it in the uh, Contemporary Writers at Work class here at UAlbany. Uh, we, we like to start these interviews with, with sort of a, a pretty general question about your, your path uh, to becoming a writer. You know, when, when, did you, when did you begin to think it was something that you, you wanted to do? Uh, were there particular inspirations or, or teachers or, or mentors along the way that sort of helped guide you uh, in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I always wanted to be a writer. I just didn't know that it was a job. So, you know, I'd always, I'd always written and I'd always read a lot. And um, when I was an only child, I was in, in my head a lot. So um, I had, you know, somewhere there are boxes and boxes of like storybooks that I, that I wrote um, all of my life. But I went to college um, anticipating that I would be a political science major and that lasted one semester. And then um, I think that was, it also was sort of a larger reevaluation of my, of my life plan, which I thought I wanted to be I thought I wanted to be a politician or or a lawyer or an actress, which is, and they're always all versions of storytelling and, and all versions of kind of thinking about the, the gulf between the interior and the exterior self that I'm obsessed with as a writer, but um, but we're not like my actual calling, I realized fairly quickly. Um, I was I was lucky to have a, a really good undergraduate creative writing program. Um, and I think I I hadn't read a lot of contemporary fiction before I got to college. I hadn't read um, certainly not a lot of contemporary literary fiction. I had read a lot of kind of classics and then I had read a lot of like drugstore mysteries that I pilfered from my parents, which actually I think gave me a wonderful sense of narrative structure. I don't mean to knock the drugstore mystery. Like I think all books fundamentally operate like mysteries in some level, um, but, I, but I hadn't read a lot of things that um, were about a world I recognized and also felt like they were paying careful attention to kind of language and rhythm and sound um, and once I sort of started to encounter those in um, in creative writing classes, uh, it sort of became clearer to me what kind of a writer I wanted to be. I think I had been um, trying very hard to write these sort of dense allegorical stories before that, um, and suddenly I could sort of see what else you could do. Um, and I was I was lucky in that I had a lot of really great um, undergraduate creative writing professors. My um, my first fiction class was supposed to be with Victor Laval and the last minute he something came up and he couldn't teach the class and so Matt Johnson taught the class instead who you know of course is an amazing writer but at the time I was like 18 and I'd studied like I'd spent the summer studying you know like I'd read Victor's book and I was like I'm ready for this class I know what this I know this teacher can like knows about writing and so then Matt showed up and I was like now I have to read your book I don't know who you are like how do I know that you know anything about writing <laughs> we're good friends now but um 
but it but it took me a couple of weeks of being sort of very salty because I had, um I had signed up for one thing and um, and then I had to take a class with Victor the next semester and so I that was a it was a really it was a really good introduction to having my writing taken seriously I think before that I had felt like writing was something that had this sort of easy reward value that I felt like I was good at it. And so I would turn something in and people would be like, oh, you are a good writer. And then I would have some sort of psychological reward. And it was the first time I felt like someone had done more than that with my work. It sort of said, this is what I, this is, you know, not that there was a lot of sort of praise and reassurance, but it was also a lot of like very careful kind of line editing. Um, this is what I think you're trying to do. What are you thinking in this paragraph? And nobody had ever sort of ever asked questions of my work in that way. Um, and so I feel lucky to have, um, been in an undergraduate creative writing program that was both supportive and also kind of taking me seriously because it taught me to take myself seriously and to ask those kinds of questions. Um, but I also think that, you know, my, my takeaway from workshops in general, I went straight from undergraduate to my MFA program um, where I had four really different um, workshop faculty, all of whom were wonderful in their own way. My, my very first professor there was Elizabeth McCracken. Um, who said on the first day of class, you know, if 20, if 15% of what you hear is useful, you're in a very good workshop, which is, um, which the, the trick is like, which 15%? And I think that what I took away um, from all of those experiences was sort of learning that I had to have my own kind of aesthetic goals, that there were, there was not a story I could have written as brilliant readers as all of the people I had the opportunity to work with were that could have pleased all of them equally. Um, and that ultimately I had to sort of decide what I wanted to do. Um, and and learn how to filter out the advice that wasn't serving it, but also learn how to hear the advice that that illuminated how much more difficult the work was sometimes than I was doing. So, um, so yeah, I wrote probably about three quarters of my first book either as an undergraduate or in graduate school, and then um, and then spent years revising and writing the last couple of stories. And so I think the book came out four years after I graduated graduate school from graduate school and a lot of that was um, kind of looking at the work with greater clarity and um, working on um, revising the stories once I'd kind of understood what a story was. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all, that's all fascinating. I wanna, I wanna go back to one, one thing you said earlier about, uh, about as an undergraduate, you, you encountered those voices that, that somehow depicted a recognizable world or that were different from the, the, the mysteries you've been reading and the, the classics you've been reading somehow. Uh, could you say more about which voices those were? What, what, were, the, what were the stories or novels that, that called out to you uh, back then? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think the first, the first thing that made me really think about the short story was I think, I think it was the 2004 edition. It was the bright orange edition of West American short stories, um, which, um, which had, I think, Zizi Packer in it, and it had Nilda in it, the, the Juno Diaz story. Yeah. And I think I, I sort of read those and was like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know you could do this. Um, and I think- um, Was that Brownie? Later, was, sorry. The, was the ZZ Packer story Brownies or was it- uh, I think it might've been Brownies. I can't remember because I think she's been in Best American more than once. And so Brownies might've been a different year, but um, I remember the orange cover and, and I'm, I'm banned from my office because because I failed to get a flu shot because I was trying not to take the bus during COVID to, to go to the doctor's office. So um, I think actually they just sent an email that I'm unbanned because flu season is over, but I can't, I can't look at my anthologies. So, um, but uh, I also, I mean, I think relatively early, not immediately, but relatively early, I also read Alice Monroe and Edward P. Jones, who I think were people who I still think about all the time in terms of the capacity of the short story form, just the way that they use time and story structure. Um, and I think those are the writers that I've sort of, um, uh, in, my, in my own life as a story writer, kind of thought about the most in terms of how did they do that? Sometimes I don't know, but sometimes I can sort of try to figure out like, how did, how did that time thing happen? And it's actually really instructive for me. Um, yeah. well, that's great. I mean, I, I know that uh, that this this book, uh, you know, the Office of Historical Corrections was in some ways, uh, so, you know, begun pointed towards writing a novel in in, in some iteration. Uh, and listening to you talk about the story form and mentioning Monroe and Jones and, and so many others, and and just being you know floored by you know story after story in this collection, uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about 
the, the sort of pressure to, as a fiction writer, to write novels and how you resisted that pressure, how this collection kind of took shape in, I don't know, with that pressure kind of, uh, I don't know, around it, I suppose. Uh, and, and do you, are you still drawn to a novel or, or are, you, are you veering towards the Alice Munro uh, model, do you think? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm by nature, I, I am, I'm an only child and a November Scorpio, so I don't take instruction well, I think, but, um, I think that I don't have a problem like being hardheaded when I don't want to do something. So, um, I, I never, I mean, I also just think it's a weird thing to feel like pressure about your work because ultimately what anyone wants is the best version of your work. And, um, that's always going to be the thing that you're most excited about. So I feel like it just doesn't even make practical sense for me to be like, what does someone else want my work to be? <laughs> so, um, and I will say, I mean, I've had a very, I, I, I have I've been lucky in that I've had a very patient and supportive publisher and, um, and then I had, you know, the luck of my first book being kind of recognized in a way that, that bought me some time to play with the second book and, and to say like, I'm turning in something that's not what I told you I was turning in um, and have that, that fly. So um, I, I don't know, but I also think that your work is the only part of the process you can control, right? Everything else is chaotic and external and largely subjective. And so I think this is the only thing I can do is, is do work that I feel good about and let it go and I feel like it's ready. And so in, in insofar as I'm a terrible compartmentalizer in general, but I think in this particular way, I've learned to be a good compartmentalizer and that my work is a different entity than my career. And so I do the work and then I think about my career. Um, I think, that um, right now uh, I am working on a novel. Um, I, I don't know if I can get away with working on a novel and then turning in a short story collection again. So um, I, uh, I don't want to test my publisher's patience more than necessary. So I believe this will be a novel. Um, and um, if that changes, they'll be the first to know. <laughs> but um, I like, I like, I mean, I think I like max novels because of their capacity to be maximal. Even as a short story writer, I mean, I think quite a while, like when I was, I like a maximal short story, you know, I think that um, I tend to want to sort of figure out, I like the density, but I also want to take up as much space as possible. I think a lot about kind of the vertical space in a story and sort of time movement in a story and how big that can be, even if the story itself feels compressed. And um, my favorite novels kind of are either are either the kind of very compressed, dense novels that feel like long short stories or are they just very kind of spiraling novels that have 50 million threads that you couldn't fit in a story form? Um, so I think the novel that I'm working on now is uh, closer to the latter, but, um, but we'll find out. It could lose a lot of pages in editing and <laughs> it could be anything by the time I finished. <laughs> when, you say, when, you say, uh, when you say vertical space for, for a story or for a novel, uh, what, like, what, what does that describe for you? Sorry, yeah, I'm talking in my own metaphors. Is, is so, so one of my favorite things to do is, I'm a terrible artist, but I sort of draw a skyscraper on the chalkboard because I think that a short story often like, the present action takes place on one floor, right? It's confined, but you have access to the entire past and the entire present. And the story is most interesting to me sometimes when in very, in very rapid space, you move between um, those planes of the story. So that sometimes you're in back, so not for very long. And sometimes you're in some sort of glimpse of the future, but not for very long, but it does a kind of world of work just to, you know, to give an example, because I'd already talked about Edward P. Jones, his story the first day is like three pages, right? But so much of the work in that story is done by a clause in the first sentence, which is, um, the first sentence is on an otherwise unremarkable September day, long before I learned to be ashamed for, of my mother. And then it goes on to be about the first day of school, but that clause just kind of hangs there. And it's not like we ever catch up to it fully. It's it's implicit in, in what happens next, but it's but it's also sort of at the emotional core of that story. And so I think that's sort of those little flickers of moving out of time, which is what I think of what I'm talking about, kind of vertical movement in a story is moving into the future and moving into the past. Mm -hmm. Do so yeah. much work. Yeah, thank you. I mean that and that might that might connect to the the next question I want to ask, uh, which is about uh, you know, in, in the acknowledgments to office of, the Office of Historical Corrections, you write that, uh, I'll just quote it, this book is among other things about grief and loss 
and about women unwilling to diminish their desires to live full and complex lives. And I mean, again and again in these stories, it seems to me, uh, I mean, part of why they're so moving is the kind of unflinching way that they, they confront and render individuals who are struggling with grief uh, in their families, in, in society, in, in, in life and in love. And I wonder, I wanted to ask you about, you know, how you do that, you know, which is kind of an impossible question to answer, uh, I imagine, but, you know, how, how do you bear it? How do you do it? Uh, another way to get at that question might be to think about how, when you're, when you're teaching and students are trying to, are struggling to write about grief and injustice and, 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 and other topics, how do you, how do you help them or how do you guide them? But I, I think maybe that, Maybe that connects to what you were saying about the verticality of, of, of narrative and how, how, grief, how grief works in your stories on so many different levels. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a conscious answer and a not conscious answer. And the not conscious answer is, in the first draft, I usually don't know what the story is about until it gets there. So had I set out to write a book about grief, um, I probably would have failed, but, um, but it sort of kept coming into all of the stories and at that point, you know, often the sort of the moment of revelation when the sort of submerged part of a story comes to the surface. I feel like I'm using lots of like linear metaphors. They're not all the same metaphor right now, but um, but I feel like there's there's usually something kind of underneath the story. And when it kind of breaks open is when you realize what the story is about. And the first person that happens for is is me, as the writer. And often that happens kind of late in the first draft, and so it's too late to back out of it. But I realize what I've actually been writing about. Um, that's the sort of less conscious answer. I think the more intentional answer is that sort of once I understand what the story is about um, is thinking about the story structure, which is sometimes thinking about time in the story, which is thinking about how is this, how do I use the way this person assembles time or moves between the past and the present to say something about kind of what they have and haven't, what they have and have not dealt with. Um, sometimes it's kind of thinking about time in terms of the psychology of storytelling. Um, sometimes it's thinking about time in terms of like where that, where that moment comes in the story where you can't evade what it's really about anymore. And that I think is is about the structural relationship between the active plot and the emotional plot. I think one of the things that's that I was doing in this book that's a little different than what I was doing in my first book was I a little bit let go of my investment in agency. I think in my first book, even though I was writing about characters who were sort of dealing with structural circumstances, because I'd read so many stories or, or you know portrayals in which I felt like young women, especially young black women, were kind of flattened or flattened into tragedy, it was really important to me to be writing characters who made choices, even if the choices were limited by the scope of kind of what, what kinds of decisions were available to them. Um, mm -hmm. I think I let go of that a little bit in this book because I was interested in the kind of trauma that doesn't have a choice attached to it. I was interested in things like grief, which is like a thing that happens to you, which is not a story. And so I think to turn grief into a story what has to happen is there's a present action that is often not in super consequential, right? It's all the things you're doing to evade from the thing that matters. And so there is a foregrounded narrative, but the actual interesting moment in the story is when the story kind of catches up to that attempt to evade it, when that story catches up to like all the things the person's doing in the present to not look at what actually matters. And that's sort of how I can write about something that feels like grief or injustice or something systemic. So when it, when it cracks into the story, in spite of everything the character's doing to try not to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, would you mind uh, giving an example from like into your process with one of the stories, like when you, when, you know, you're, you're writing the story and then you, then it clicks or, or when, when that moment happens, when you realize what the submerged narrative is, or uh, is there, is there one that, I mean, I, I, or if you don't like to talk about that, you know, I, I, that's completely understandable, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear how how that happened i'm sure it happens over years you know you i know in reading about boys go to jupiter you you've written about or you, you talked in other interviews about how there was a draft in 2014 and then 2017 i mean it's just that the story took a while uh and I, I would i would love to hear about how how that process goes for one of the stories in the collection yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm looking puzzled because it's sort of it's it's the only way that I write anything. So I'm just trying to figure out which one which one it makes sense to talk about because I sort of always have that moment. Um, I think maybe just I'll start with the beginning. Is that the first story in the book? 
happily ever after. Yeah. Surfing yeah. is my only attempt to avoid writing an essay because like once a year I get into agreeing to write nonfiction and then immediately hate myself because like I have I have a job where I get to make things up and then I agree to this harder job of not making things up and then making really nice things up myself. But, uh, but very nice people ask me to write nonfiction, and so I, I say yes because I like them, and then um, and then I hate myself. So um, I was supposed to be writing this essay uh, for Roxane Gay's issue on the body, and um, and I couldn't do it. I mean, I think that you know my mother had just died, and I, I had various thoughts about kind of illness and the body, and um, and it was just too soon, and all of the sort of connective things that that would have gone into the essay, I, I couldn't do, and so. I said I was going to write a short story instead, but I think that short story was in ways that I, and it seems like really obvious in retrospect that um, that the short story was sort of haunted by the essay that I was trying and failing to write, but it wasn't obvious to me because I think had it been obvious, I'd be like, well, I can't write this either. And so I think it took to the middle of the story to say, oh, this is, this is what the story is. The story is about grief. It's also, I mean, I think about anxiety about the future, both in a kind of a broader, um, generational sense and also in a sense of what is the future when you sort of lost the person you imagined would, would be in the future, which is another, which is another thing about grief and it's sort of time movement, right? I think that grief is an intense present experience, but it's also something that requires you to kind of negotiate your memory and create a narrative of the past. And it's also something that requires you to imagine. I mean, I think at some point in that story, there's um, there's a line that says like what future had there ever been but the imaginary but I think that sort of sense of having to imagine a future that is different than the future you did imagine is also kind of profoundly attached to grief and so um I think once I understood what that story was about I understood where to linger and it still took me years I mean that first draft had a much shorter hospital scene um because I think it was still kind of avoiding the core of the story and it took me um, kind of a year of not looking at the story to look at it and say like this needs to slow down because this is sort of actually what the story is circling in all its other forms. Which could you say like I mean that was that the first story you wrote for the collection? Oh no, not at all. No, okay. Uh, could could you say which was which was the first one, which was the last, which was the most difficult, and and maybe which which one came. With uh, with with least difficulty. <laughs> kind of, I don't I don't know that I can answer the difficulty question because I feel like every story I've ever been satisfied with has tried to kill me. Like that's how I know it's a story. So um, uh, they're just different kinds of difficult. I mean, it's also yeah. it feels yeah. like I should be able to give you a more direct answer on the time question, but I kind of can't do that either. Like chronologically, the first in terms of when I started the first draft, yeah. the earliest story in the book is Alcatraz because I actually drafted that in graduate school. Um, and there was a version of it that actually um, was originally in the manuscript for my first book. And we pulled it from that. And then it, um, and then it was published the year after uh, in like 2010. So it was published right after my first collection came out. But, um, but then when I was looking at it for this collection, it was, it had been 10 years, you know? And I felt like in some ways it really obviously felt like connected to the material in this collection, but it also felt obviously like the work of a younger writer. And there was always a kind of retrospective frame. So I felt like that was one of the stories that needed more revision between its original published form and the collection. And one of the things I did was kind of lean into that retrospective voice and give myself a little bit more room um, in the future of the story. And it was also a complicated revision because it's the only story that I've ever asked anyone's permission to publish. It has, it's not at all a, a true story, but it has enough uh, references to actual family history that I felt like I had to ask my mother if it was okay. And I, so when I wrote the story in graduate school, I gave her the draft and said, like, if you don't, and in retrospect, like at the time, like nobody had ever published anything I'd written. It was like a lot of nerve on my part to be like, somebody's going to publish this mommy. So you should read it and make sure you're okay with it. But, um, but I did. And she, and she um, really liked the story and was pleased when it was published years later. But I felt you know, by the time I was revising it, my mother was dead. And so I couldn't ask her again, like, are you okay with this revision? And so um, it was it was fraught just in terms of wanting to preserve the core of the story and kind of spiral out around it to make it feel more of a piece with the work that I was doing now without kind of erasing both what was working in the original version and also what I promised to do in the original version. Um, so it's both the first and last story because it was the one I was editing up until like 
it went into page proofs. Like I, I, I changed the ending right before the book went into press and got a very polite call from my editor's assistant who was basically like, why did you delete this paragraph? And I was I just whole freaked out thing. She's like, put the paragraph back. So I did basically. Um, but yeah, so um, so it's the same answer, I think, the first and last story. In terms of what I started last was the novella, um, in terms of when I started the first draft, but in terms of when I edited things, Alcatraz was both the first and the last story. Yeah. No, it's so interesting. That I mean, I think not enough people think about how collections are are shaped, you know, and, and to hear you talk about how how that story was revised up until the last moment is is fascinating. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure a lot, a lot went into just the arrangement of the stories and, and all, all of that uh, in terms of the order and things like that. I mean, I guess it would be, of course, you're going to put the novella last, but before that, I, I imagine you shift the stories around or uh, did you always know? I actually think that I thought the novella was going to be in the middle of the book. I don't... Interesting. I remember thinking that there were there were stories that felt more realist to me and stories that felt less realist. And I thought, I originally thought of the novella as this like marker between them. And then it, the novella is like took a different shape. And also I cut one of the stories that was less realist. And so then that arrangement no longer made sense. And it really did feel like the novella had its own, had its own gravity and had its own finality that it would have been weird to put it before anything else. Um, but it was only in like the second, second draft of the novella that I figured that out. Um, I mean, I think had I tried to stick it in the middle of the book, somebody else probably would have told me no, but um, by the time it turned into the manager, it was at the end of the book, but it, it wasn't something I intuitively knew. Um, and I, I think that the first story felt important to me because I, I do think that part of what the early stories in the collection do is introduce kind of what the book is doing and then immediately in some way complicate that. And so I thought I wanted to have um, that first story kind of circles all of the themes that come up again and, um, you know, is, is, about, is about grief and anxiety and relationships and loneliness and race and kind of the unexpected quotidian racism and history and our kind of weird fetishistic but not like realistic approach to history. And so um, all of that felt like things that the other stories would circle back to. And so it felt like the place to start. Um, and um, and then I think I immediately wanted to kind of go some weird places and, um, and I wanted to save, you know, there, there are some stories that feel a little bit riskier than others and I wanted to save them until I'd hopefully built up some trust with the reader. So like, it takes a while to get to the volcano because I thought I wanted the reader to like sort of, sort of trust me and run with it. Um, by the time you get there, of course you can't actually control the order in which people read books. So, um, <laughs> people probably, I, I cringe a little when people are like, oh, I just started in the middle, but they're allowed to do that. It's, I'm not the boss of the book. Um, but I did really think about the movement through the book. <laughs> no, there's something, there's something wonderful and beautiful about having that first story be called Happily Ever After and that, that being the open, you know, a phrase we always associate with the ending and that being the beginning of the book. It's just, it's, it works on so many levels, it seems to me. Uh, but al also in terms of introducing the book, I mean, there, there are the two epigraphs, right, uh, from from Baldwin and from and from Lucille Clifton, and and those those do incredible work for the book too. It seems to me, in terms of talking about the past and, and the past as as a prison that we need to escape and and maybe can escape, and whether we understand it or not, we might not be able to escape it. Uh, and to have those set alongside the, you know, the, the title and the novella, this idea of historical correction. Uh, I wondered if you, if you could talk a little bit about that, about, uh, I, I don't know the best way to phrase it, but, but almost like how you, how you want your readers, your idea, if you could control your readers, which we can't, but like how you would like them to wrestle with, uh, with questions about the past uh, or the, the possibility of historical correction uh, in this, you know, in, in this, you know, fraught, divided, brutal, you know, contemporary moment we inhabit. Uh, I mean, how do you how do you hold those ideas in your head, and how would you like to how would you like your readers to walk away? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have an investment in how they walk away because I do think that 
the idea of fiction is at most you're having 60% of the conversation, right? Like you have to leave space for the reader to sort of think about things. You have to leave questions in the work. I think that the epigraph is more how they walk into the work, which I am less afraid of trying to control. Um, and so I think that it's just a way for me of foregrounding the questions that I feel like link the collection, especially in a collection, because I think it can take some time to sort of see the pattern in the story is that hopefully they're doing different enough work that it doesn't feel like you're reading the same story over and over again. So it's a way of signaling, okay, but look for this question, like wait for it to come up. Um, and in, in this um, in this book, I think the recurring question was very much, you know, what do we do with history? What do we do with it in terms of how it's marked us individually? What do we do with it um, collectively? Who does it belong to? And what does it do to a story to change the protagonist? Yeah, no, I, I think that, that comes across so much in the stories that the that uh, we're we're left with with questions that aren't answered, you know. For for, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking of Boys Go to Jupiter, but but also in so many other stories, these, these questions the questions linger. And I, I understand what you're saying about not 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 uh, focusing on on what the readers are going to walk away with, but it it seems to me that that so many people walk away with the, the questions churning in their head, and that that seems positive uh I, I, I but maybe that maybe that's being overly optimistic i, I don't know <laughs> uh i think we, we have time for maybe one more uh question I, and, and you mentioned that you were that you're working on this novel uh are you are you a writer who's willing to talk about what uh, the, the novel you're working on or is that is that something that you, you'd rather keep under wraps yeah, you know, I think the one thing I've learned in 10 years of being a writer, like I've learned very little and that's okay because mostly you're starting over every time anyway, but I've learned not to talk about my work in progress because, because I think then you make rules for it that you feel like you have to hold yourself to. And it's a long time, I think, before a project needs rules, right? Everything, everything has an infancy and you, you know, you can, you can take a baby to high school, but why? You know, like, I think that um, there's, there's no reason to hold yourself to a sort of sense of like, this is what the book needs to learn and do until you sort of kept the book alive long enough to know what it is organically. And so yeah. um, in this particular phase, I'm just trying to keep the book alive. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I just can't wait to read it. And, 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 and maybe I'll just add one more question if you don't mind about, about your, you know, what it's been like now to be, I don't know how long you've been teaching at Johns Hopkins and how long you've been teaching in general, but what it's, what it's been like to to be on that side of the workshop table, and uh, how how has that shaped your your writing practice, or or anything along those lines? How how has it been different to be the the leader of the workshop as opposed to being the, a member of the workshop? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been teaching I've been teaching since graduate school pretty consistently. I've been teaching for ten years, and my first full time teaching job was in two thousand eight. But before that, I, I taught in graduate school, and I taught as a fellow at Wisconsin right after graduate school. Um, and this is my third tenure track job. So I actually feel like finally, like my publications have caught up with me to the point that I don't have to like explain to the students why I'm in front of the class. Like I was teaching it in the MFA program before my first book came out. And so um, it was, um, and I was younger than most of my graduate students. So I feel like I'm finally old enough that just by showing up, I have some level of authority and that's actually been great. But I mean, I also think that, um, you know, it's, it's interesting teaching because it, it uses your same brain as writing, so it does sometimes slow you down, but it also, I think, guards against a particular kind of despair, which is the despair of thinking your work doesn't matter. I mean, I think because I spend all day talking about books and language and, and seeing what it, what it can do to sort of put something in someone's hands and see them light up, I feel like I have less of that sort of sense of um, existential crisis of like, what am I even doing or what is fiction that that it requires me to kind of remember over and over again why I love books and literature and what it means for a student to encounter that. Um, I also think that it it does give me a language for that editorial brain, right? I think the first draft never gets easier, the blank page never gets easier, and it shouldn't because you're always trying to do something that you don't actually know the rules for and that you haven't seen done before or done yourself before. But I think you get better at being an editor of yourself. Increasingly, like the longer I teach, the the more I move away from like working and not working and liking and disliking and, and try to give as much more than anything value neutral description to say like, this is what I think I read. This is what I understood your project to be. 
And I think that is really useful for reading my own work, right? To get out of my editorial brain to be like, this, this is terrible, just burn it. Or like, I'm brilliant, I don't need to change a word and just sort of describe to myself the project of my writing. And I think that's been like a practice that's evolved as both a teacher and a writer kind of simultaneously is kind of stepping back from judgment on the first draft, whether it's a student's work or my own and saying like, what is this? Like, what do I see it trying to do? And where's the disconnect if I'm describing something that is not what other people are seeing, what's not being communicated? Um, but I think that uh, using that part of my brain as a teacher has made it easier to use that part of my brain as a writer. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, it's just been such a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm, we're, we're all so grateful that you, 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 you gave us the gift of your time to talk with us in the conversation today. Thank, thank you so much. You.